Good evening, everyone. Um, with a great pleasure, um, we are very happy to welcome Stefana Parashko to join our winter term um, sliver lecture. Um, Stefana's practice and research um, is working at the intersection of architecture, digital fabrication, as well as um, computational design. She's currently an assistant professor at Princeton University, where she founded the Create Laboratory at Princeton, and she's also co-leading the PhD program in technology. Stefana's research has a strong focus on robotics. Um, having completed the doctor dissertation at Etiha on cooperative robotic assembly, Stefana had explored the multi-robot fabrication, as well as the relationship um, of the robotics to architecture design. Um, so some of her other research interests also including um, the agent-based system to sequential design and optimization methods. So it would be very exciting to see some of the research at tonight's lecture. Uh, and I'm also pretty sure that at the Angel Monte, we're also sharing some of the interests such as robotics, as well as the agent-based simulation. Um, her work was published in peer-reviewed publications and as well as art and architecture magazines such as Kunst and Architecture, Princeton's Pigeon Magazine, um, and Xi'an Design Week, and the Autonomy of Structure exhibition in London. So without further ado, let's welcome Stefana Parashko. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I'll quickly um, go through the many clicks to share the screen properly and then I'll be with you. Um, And okay, almost there. Two more clicks, I think. Take a time. <clears throat> um, all right, so I hope this would work. Um, Thanks a lot for having me. Um, uh, technical details, if the videos aren't showing properly because of the internet connection, do let me know. Um, that's always a bit of a gamble, but I'm hoping things will work out. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm, uh, it's one of the few say uh, good things that came out of this pandemic is that we can connect a lot easier and uh, all these events over uh, online events where we can really get in touch are, um, yeah, they're a really great thing <laughs> to do. So I'm very happy to be here. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, and thanks for the intro. I, I, I prepared my own little intro, but I'll just flip through it real quickly. I was uh, born in Bucharest uh, where I started studying architecture. Um, and I moved to Stuttgart um, for, um, to continue my architectural studies um, where I finished my diploma in architecture um, and I worked with Nipper Selberg Engineering and with design production during my time there. Um, and then I moved on to Zurich in 2014 for my PhD studies. Um, and as, as was already mentioned, since uh, February 2019, I'm in Princeton, um, where, um, oops, sorry. Yeah, where I'm running, I'm leading the Create Lab Princeton, um, Create standing for computation and robotics, enabling architectural technologies, which um, I think also summarizes pretty well my research motivation that I center around the wish of enabling more technology use in architecture. Um, I also um, co direct the technology PhD program together with my colleague, Boris Meggers. We 
have uh, all sorts of common interests, including climb their own structures, PhD studies, and guiding PhDs um, through our program. So, um, moving on to the Create Lab and my own research, um, what do we we actually do. I like to look at digital fabrication processes and in particular robotic ones um, and the way that computational design tools interact with them and can allow for them to be fully integrated in the design process. So um, beyond developing new new robotic systems and new material systems and implementing and testing them. Interested in what architects, um, where the shortcomings are nowadays and what we can do to improve that, to integrate these technologies more into our practice. Um, if we look at architectural design, one could describe it as a result of many parameters such as geometry, structure, fabrial, um, and this is by no means a comprehensive list. It's just an abstraction to that. But the interactions between these parameters can be quite complex um, when we look at each of them. And particularly with new technological advancements that move faster and faster every day, we are kind of at a point where we're reaching our limits. Um, these parameters, intuitively and using them intuitively in a top down design process as traditionally was done. Traditional tools can be really useful, um, if not indispensable for architectural designs, um, allowing to uncover and process these complex relationships between design and the many factors that technological advancements they have uh, many of them have majorly impacted um, allow are able to adjust to all these new technologies and challenges that arise. And one reason for this being that traditionally the design process was a sequential one and with a pretty clear break between design and material. Uh, so the fabulous processing these high making processes more material efficient, more cost efficient, safer. Um, However, in construction, uh, our construction sites still mainly look like this. Building is still a manual process where complex logistics and different fabrication steps are solved only in, in post-design processes. And one reason for this delay or shift in the digitalization of construction is that architecture requires the design and fabrication of individual objects every single time which just doesn't lend itself for classical automation as we see it in other industries. And this is why robotics and automation have taken a special role in the different direction in architecture. And what we see is that research in the field has identified the potential of robots for new designs and new geometries, but is often focused on, fabrica on the fabrication of these specific non-standard geometries. Um, which is a very niche uh, application and, and field. And on the other end of the spectrum in industry, we see digital tools mostly used to automate existing, highly standardized processes. So what happened is that the architect is assuming one of two pretty extreme roles, either becoming a specialist in a very narrow technical area or being an end user, um, dependent on black box tools um, that are pre-developed by other in other fields and that we basically just use. I very much believe that um, we can reimagine these this relationship between architects and technology. Um, and we can 
contribute to our discipline by uh, building bridges between these extremes that digitalization has seen in architecture and by tackling the high entry barriers to technology and lowering the accessibility of new tools and methods for architects and designers. Mine um, that from the base of my current research and design interest. Um, and as a world, and I don't consider it, I know all the answers on the table. So I'll start with my time in Stuttgart between 2006 and 2012, where my research focus lied on exploring computational design tools and the intersection between the current design parameters. Um, this is a very old project of mine. It's actually my diploma project from Stuttgart. And back then in 2012, I started questioning the typical top-down design process by looking into multiple scales of a grid shell structure as an example. Um, and while the project doesn't specifically address fabrication parameters, it looks at ways of integrating the many, multiple different parameters at the same hierarchical level. Um, and uh, looks at computational um, methods that allow designers to do this. So um, together with my colleague, Marco Bauer, who I developed the project with, we looked at agent-based systems um, that can adjust to external influences through their position and orientation and through the implementation of very simple behaviors. Um, this way, different parameters from structural behavior ones to lighting parameters um, to be addressed simultaneously and not in a sequential hierarchical process as we um, were used to from traditional design. And below, beyond exploring the power of agent-based systems, um, I was particularly struck by how much the visualization of these designs, of, this, of the design generation process, how much just seeing it um, helped with understanding the underlying processes and what effect different parameters had on our designs. So we worked with different adjustment roles, as we call them, uh, in this case, um, lighting conditions, geometrical, structural um, rules, which each led to completely different shapes um, as only through the interaction of the individual agents, so no overarching definition of the, the final shapes. And uh, yeah, the results showcase these different criteria and their impact on the purely locally defined overall geometry. Um, as a research associate as a, at ITK Stuttgart, I was part of the teaching and research team of the ICD ITK EU Research Pavilion 2013-14 with the goal of the project being to employ robotic fabrication in order to eliminate the need for formwork for fiber-based construction processes. Um, I'm gonna hope. Oh, is this, is this okay uh, volume-wise? Can I speak over it? Yeah, it actually doesn't have a sound, so please. Oh, perfect, perfect. All right. <laughs> That's even better, probably. <laughs> so the project was based on biomimetic principles, um, extract the beetle's elytra being a protective shelf over the beetle's wings. Um, and uh, we chose to look at this particular part of the beetle mainly due to its lightweight character and fiber arrangements. We looked at the elytra at two different scales to first identify by the overall arrangement of um, the so-called trabeculae. These are little holes that you can see right now, actually, in, the, in this double layer, this trabeculae to identify characteristics that could be attracted into roles for generating fiber-based mod modules that are light, but still structurally um, robust. Um, um, and we developed a design 
system that, that, that try to negotiate all the parameters from geometric and incorporate it in the design. Uh, and very stiff uh, formwork for the uh, for the, um, of the individual components. It allowed us to reuse position um, and wind these components without any um, without uh, any um, additional support structures inside of the components. So everything was reused for the winding process. And then the fiber was pulled through a resin bath, wound over the component and hardened overnight so that afterwards we could take out, uh, take it out from the robot and um, assembled together by hand into a pavilion that weighs uh, less than 600 kilograms at the end of the day. So um, to show you a few more details, I particularly looked at how the information can be embedded into one individual component by generating its geometry so that it can fulfill the multiple input parameters. Um, and what was of high uh, importance was the way that this winding syntax uh, was generated um, because the geometric result, the actual shape of the component was a pure result of the material interactions of the fibers being wound around the module. So every new fiber would press onto its previously, onto the previously laid fibers and the shape would adjust with every cycle of this winding process. So what we did was we only visualized the topology, the topological information of how these fibers were wound. Um, but work with a geometry that was a purely material uh, result, from it, which um, was extremely, on the one hand, hard to work with, but also um, worked well in terms of representation and working with it. We ended up with um, modules that consisted of different layers, carbon fiber for reinforcement um, and glass fiber layer for molding the shape. Um, and different dimensions, the smallest being about half a meter in diameter and the largest about 2.4 meters in diameters and all of them were, as mentioned, assembled into the pavilion. They were connected with screws um, and the pavilion uh, ended up very lightweight. We could actually move the whole thing with a few people um, as needed. So, Moving forward, this is a project from my time in Zurich um, during my teaching and PhD studies there. Um, the Brick Labyrinth was a teaching and re project developed together with students of the MAS Digital Fabrication there. Um, and the um, is, it was to build, to design and fabricate a large scale brick labyrinth um, using over 10,000 bricks. And as opposed to any previous chromatical or research projects, which I think uh, many people are very familiar with, and bricks have been used there for 10 years, uh, for over 10, now it's 15 years. <laughs> um, the, the challenge for us was that we did not want to use any glue or mortar. So the bricks are purely dry stacked um, so that we could produce a reversible process that we could take apart again. Um, so the challenge for the students in particular was to develop a design uh, of a stable structure that is buildable with the two robots, um, but that takes this, this very um, known and familiar construction system to the extremes and really explores what we can do with dry stack bricks. And while the project um, focused on this fabrication challenge of building a very large structure in a short time, the research question that captured me most was how to combine the structural assessment and the stability analysis with the fabrication process to really fully explore the, pot the potential of robotic assembly in this process. 
Um, students developed a new brick bond, which made use of the transversal bricks position. By shifting these bricks that are rotated by 90 degrees, uh, we could control the position of the center of the ma of mass of the bricks, and this way, um, basically shift the center of mass of the entire wall um, by a small amount, which allowed us to um, fabricate these leaning walls uh, beyond a leaning angle that was intuitively expected to function and to still be stable. Um, it resulted in a spiraling lab labyrinth with, um, with uh, different brick bonds and different um, configurations of the brick um, positionings. And because we had this huge stability challenge, what we did it was we worked with students to develop a simple geometric stability analysis tool that we wrote us ourselves um, and um, it worked by going through each layer of the brick wall and calculate how the mass is transferred to the supporting bricks and then working through each of the layers to check if the system was still um, this allowed us to visualize where the stable um, or not and at what point it would actually collapse. validate and extended the simulation through physical test um, rather than reverting complex and com well this um, seemed very simple to integrate, um, it, it, it actually allowed us to work a lot closer with the structural problems that appeared rather than having a, a very complex um, simulation analysis process um, that would give us a yes or no answer, so to say. And through these physical validations that we worked with additional stability through the friction between the bricks, um, so, as you see here, the, on the left, the simulation would say that the structure is actually failing, but the physical tests constructed confirmed that it wasn't failing, and this is purely the result of the friction between the bricks in these transversal layers. So we, we connect two leaning walls through these transversal layers to transfer the forces from one to the other. Um, and this allowed us to push the limits um, of the leaning walls even further. Um, we employed the system in the labyrinth uh, and in the sections where we wanted these leaning walls. Um, and the entire process of hands-on working and writing our own simulations, it really allowed us to understand how the structure behaves beyond the yes-no answer that one would get from, from uh, a structural analysis program. And it really enabled us to push the boundaries of um, the structural possibilities of the system. Um, at the same time, we, of course, were working with the robotic fabrication process. We developed and implemented um, this process from defining the robotic setup, the end effector tools to allow us to pick up multiple bricks at the same time and place them. Um, um, the sequence logics and the path planning strategies. We use different robots of different scales and different sizes for different tasks. And directly developing these processes and custom control and simulation tools were really crucial to a holistic approach of the design and fabrication problems. So it, it, it really enabled us to test things, adjust them, uh, and ultimately build the 10,000 brick structure in less than three weeks. Um, and then fully reverse it into a few pallet of bricks to um, get it out of there. Uh, oh yeah, and I do have a video of my colleagues, David and Luca, take you through the labyrinth. It's not the same thing as walking through it in real life. <laughs> it's really, uh, a say impressive if not scary experience to all these bricks uh, um, which unfortunately I'm still reproduced through video but this is the best shot we have. 
So um, this takes me to my PhD thesis um, where I explored cooperative robotic assembly processes for the construction of bespoke space frame-like structures. And going back to the robot's real basic functionality of moving, positioning, and holding elements in three-dimensional space, it lends itself perfectly for bespoke assembly tasks, particularly spatial ones. And by expanding the process to a two-robot process, um, we can add to the task through alternating the placement of elements so that each robot additionally serves as a support for the structure, um, which minimizes or completely eliminates the need of support or uh, formwork um, of the process. The method works as following. We, uh, one robot places a bar, then the other one places a bar. There's a connection being done manually um, and then the robot can let go again. So uh, this alternate placement of elements um, allowed one robot to always act as a support during the construction. Um, but the main challenge of the project really was exposing and working with the complex interrelations of the very different constraints um, that, um, that consist uh, in, in such a design and fabrication task and finding a design procedure that allowed us to explore the design space that was defined by the system. So uh, besides looking at this specific fabrication process, um, we had to really um, include geometric constraints, material-related constraints, structural constraints, and of course, the fabrication ones. In terms of geometry, what this robotic automated process allowed me to do is generate truly differentiated spatial structures and place material where needed. Um, the geometry is based on the aggregation of tetrahedral elements, which are volumetric, non-directional, um, geometries that can expand in all directions, so as opposed to the typical layer-based uh, geometries that we see in space frame structures. Um, these tetrahedral elements consist of three bars, which I call uh, are sequentially added uh, to the structures. Um, they're allowed to intersect. The only goal uh, is to provide statically determinate geometries um, to ensure the structural performance of it. A very crucial element uh, was the node, which directly influences the local and the global geometry. Classical nodes and spatial structures connect in one point and require prefabricated connection elements. So I was in search of uh, a node that can be fully integrated in the robotic process and doesn't require these prefabricated parts. Um, and shifting the bars along their neighbors allowed me to only have two elements touching in one point, which simplified this connection very much and allowed it to be automatically um, incorporated in the fabrication process. Um, but it also led to a loss of stiffness. It introduces bending moments into the structure um, and the structure becomes more flexible and just less rigid. So uh, in a second step, I added uh, additional connection points um, for each of the bars to make up for this loss of stiffness, um, which also led to very uh, high geometric constraints of the system. So going from a node where everything comes into a point, opening up that node by shifting the bars along their neighbors, and then adding a second connection point to every single bar, um, it solved all the structural problems, um, but it introduced very specific geometric constraints that one had to work with. Um, and this, uh, it's, it becomes visible when we try to design for the system. So while it allows you to build geometries um, that are highly differentiated, it gives you a lot more freedom uh, in, in designing these geometries than a classical prefabricated system would do. The types of constraints that are involved here are very difficult to intuitively understand and intuitively explore, so the need for computational processes was really 
uh, unquestionable. What happened was that we had to consider every single bar um, that um, needed to have two points to, to be connected in two points to the existing structure. So analyzing these tangent relationships geometrically and ensuring that these are uh, given in the final structure was crucial. Um, and to visualize that, we looked at uh, one bar situation um, that would connect to two existing bars and visualized the entire solution space where this bar could lay in space. And when you start overlaying all of the possible options, you end up with a pretty large solution space. But what's important to note is that there are areas where there is no solution. Um, and these are the areas that may designing with the system so difficult. It's clear that there are um, situations where there is no solution, but it's extremely difficult to control these situations intuitively. So we had to revert to a mathematical model of the connection um, and uh, accept that the final position of a bar was a deterministic result of this process. It was not a choice. Um, it was uh, one solution that would come out. Um, and while at first glance, the, these resulting nodes seem extremely random and kind of put together um, without much thought, they actually follow this very, very specific and constrained logic. This one consisted of 16 bars that meet at one point. Um, and really each bar has at least two connection to the structure. Um, and over time, there might be more coming to it. So the reason I show you all these uh, I'd say pretty painful constraints to work with <laughs> is to exemplify how many interconnections there are in such a structures and how quickly uh, one design decision leads to very, very complex relationships that are uh, just not controllable intuitively and that require um, computational methods of controlling them, but also uh, particularly important methods of visualizing them and making them somehow graspable and understandable to the designer. So besides the geometric constraints uh, that took up a lot of my time, um, there uh, I, I worked through multiple material systems to find one that fulfills the requirements of such a structure. Um, looking from simple wired connections to glued connection um, that required a custom milk notch for the glue application. Um, there's no sound. It's good. Uh, I have a video of the glue process. We did uh, give up the glue process relatively quickly because unfortunately it appears to not be. Uh, uh, sustainable in the long run. It was just weakening uh, time very, very quickly. Um, but this allowed us to explore uh, ways of integrating the connection into the robotic fabrication process. Um, there's a very long build up to the actual extending part where the robot moves to put the bar into place. It points to the next element, which is really figuring out these robotic movements and how, uh, how to tell the robot how to place these bars um, in the right position. We ultimately uh, reverted to steel and welding, which simplified the process uh, very much and provided the necessary strength in the connection. Um, we did do the welding process manually while the robots were only used for positioning and holding uh, the bars in place. This being a result of the research question, um, since automating the connection process is something that is feasible, uh, it's something that industry is looking at a lot, um, but it was not something within the scope of this work. Uh, the focus was really on identifying where the robots can be used um, to open up new design possibilities, so in the placement process. And this resulted in these um, very complex nodes and structures that went up in height to 4.2 meters um, built in the lab in Zurich. 
So with the material system in mind, um, I could move on to exploring the structure and integrity, which was also a big part of uh, this project and ensuring that this is a viable functional system. We, uh, I worked here with, with a colleague of mine, Thomas Kohlhammer, who developed an interface to um, a finite element solver using Karamba um, to then automatically translate the geometric model into a structural one and read out the stress and deformation utilizations. Um, we could then use this within an optimization process and what really helped uh, again here was having a means of visualizing the, uh, the, um, the influence that this very complex geometric system and changes to the system would have over the structural performance of it. There was clearly no linear dependency in terms of how to move a bar or move a point and how it would behave structurally, it was absolutely not uh, readable uh, what would help the structure. So we had to work with a computational process to find structures that were structurally more efficient and, um, and more performative. Um, and this takes me to, I hopefully the last big challenge of the project, which was fabrication really um, with working with two robotic arms in a common space uh, with a structure that is changing, bars being uh, added to it every, uh, at every moment. There's a very, very high risk of collisions between all involved parties. Um, so we utilize an interface to robotic simulation environments that utilizes existing path planning algorithms to calculate collision-free paths. So the main challenge here is that we robots and uh, so as a human designer, robots work in very different uh, environments. Uh, a a human would design and think in a three-dimensional geometric space, whereas robots, a robotic movement is defined in a six-dimensional rotational space, so every joint of the robot um, decides where its end effector would go. Um, and the, um, the <laughs> being a little bit distracted. Okay, I'm back. Um, so being able to intuitively tell how, uh, what values each joint of the robot should have to reach a certain point uh, is just not possible. So we need these algorithms that can, can, can define the movement of the robots uh, and make sure that we don't have collisions. Uh, there, we were able through these interfaces to, um, to robotic path planning algorithms to find these very intricate paths that allowed to place uh, the bars individually inside of the structure oh, okay. and into these positions where each bar connects to uh, their neighbors and two points. They had really um, unusual paths at times. Um, the process is very, very deterministic in the sense that uh, you, you give an input and you get this path. There is not much telling you about why this would be a good path or not. And the robots, some of the paths were really strange, like choosing to just go between the robot and these bars over there um, was uh, something you wouldn't have done intuitively. But it really allowed us to construct these very complex joints without major collision issues, um, which would not, it would just not be feasible intuitively. And um, it enabled the construction of large scale test structures that we did in the lab. And this particular one being um, built in the robotic fabrication lab at Zurich. This was the first test case that we implemented there, trying to really explore the limits of the setup as well. Um, and we built up this 4.2 meters tall structure to see what the robots can do and how high they can go. Um, this video doesn't show the welding process, which is done manually in between the steps, um, but it was cut out there. So 
after solving all these individual challenges, problems, um, and developing uh, everything from geometry, materials, structure, and fabrication, the question still remained how we can use them in a coherent design process. Um, and due to the strong role of the fabrication process, I chose the sequence to be at the base of the design, meaning that the geometry is generated in the exact same order as, as it is fabricated, defining not just geometric relations, but also structural performance and fabrication feasibility. Uh, in order to combine the different types of design variables, we had, I had discrete design variables and continuous ones, which are very difficult to put into the same process. I chose to divide the design process into individual steps uh, that each target a goal for the design. So in the first step, nodes uh, are distributed throughout a volume and the sequence uh, that is sensible based on the fabrication setup is chosen. In a second step, uh, the topology is defined um, for the structure. So only the um, connections of which new point is connected to which existing ones. This is what's defined in this step without actually fixing the geometric location of them. Um, and in a third step, um, we search for the ideal position of the nodes in terms of structural performance through an optimization process. And in the very last step, um, generating the robotic path for the fabrication. This division, while not as integrative as, for example, the first project that I've shown, it allowed to apply individual algorithms for targeted simpler problems and it led to a simplification of the problem. It did, however, introduce a hierarchical dependency between each design step, meaning that the output of one step um, had to allow for solving the next design step. So there's Again, is a rise process to design and construct functional structures such as this one that I built in Zurich, um, and it, which consisted of 210 bars and 279 connection points. Um, it, I, I, I think that the real value of this project is in exposing the limitations that are imposed by technological know-how nowadays. Um, that architects and designers uh, have to work with and have pretty limited access to. Um, this being a result of the different languages, the different communication styles, the different expectations of the field. So I think to be able to uh, fully take advantage of these processes, we need to work towards tools and methods that really help us expose and utilize the potentials, but also the limitations of these technologies in a way that architects and designers can really understand them and not just use by executing um, predefined processes that are there. Um, right, and this takes me to the last project that I want to show, which was conducted at my lab here at Princeton. Um, in uh, starting last summer until um, March this year, uh, which is a collaboration with SOM Engineering and the Form Finding Lab at Princeton. The goal of the project was to design and robotically fabricate a glass wall structure um, for uh, the Anatomy of Structure exhibition in London, which took place in March for about I believe one or two weeks before it was shut down and while we were still in production. <laughs> so the structure hasn't seen a lot of visitors, but um, we're very happy that it was actually built. Uh, we were able to somehow wrap it up, uh, not to the same size as we originally intended, but we were able to finish construction. So uh, that was the good news <laughs> of it. Um, and it builds up on the cooperative robotic processes that I developed beforehand um, and focuses on finding ways of constructing welding structures out of heavy brick material. 
Uh, this process, similarly to the, the one I showed in my thesis, uh, it uses one of the robots as an alternating support throughout the construction, which completely eliminates the need for any form of pulse work. And the goal was to design and assemble this large scale vault structure um, with the main challenge being um, a working with a very large, well, very large for academic standards, pretty large interdisciplinary team um, and finding ways of communicating and utilizing the different knowledge um, and combining that into a common design process. And similarly to the space frame projects, the possibilities are not really intuitively understandable. So showing one solution doesn't really give uh, you a lot of information about what other possibilities are there or how to improve uh, to make it better or worse. Um, so we reverted to trying to visualize design spaces uh, resulting from different constraints. In our case, we looked at uh, certain robotic setups and how to position the robots and what that would mean for the robotic reach and what types, what volumes basically emerge from the setup uh, in which we can design and how this could be combined with then the structural design process that was specifically looking for compression only geometries um, through a form finding process. So moving back and forth through these um, solution spaces and design spaces rather than through design uh, propositions, we came up with the system in which um, uh, the construction is first building a central arch by using the robots to cooperate as a backbone of the structure and then the robots build outwards towards each other individually um, to finalize the structure. We looked, uh, besides the construction logic, explored patterns that increase the stability of the structure during construction and developing a sequence that further promotes stability at every single step. Um, we were thus able to construct through many, many tests, a large vault in our lab uh, and then the final one uh, at the exhibition space. And like I said, the physical tests really played a major role in this project. Um, we were testing and adjusting all the time, started with small scale tests to understand the robotic logic uh, for the construction and then scaling it up with different materials before moving to the glass bricks, which inevitably uh, resulted in all sorts of shattered glass everywhere. We, we started testing with materials that were a little bit easier to work with, um, but it allowed us to really see where the difficulties are, what unexpected problems arise. We, we had reachability um, limitations that we reached during construction. Um, and by having a uh, design system that allows for adjustments, uh, we were really able to, to react to these things on the go while building and constructing. Um, we moved the construction to London, to the exhibition space, um, and uh, managed to construct the vault in the given time frame. Um, but again, the fact that we had a design system that wasn't based on one final geometry, but more on the possibilities and the range of possible solutions allowed us to react um, to the constraints uh, that resulted from the COVID situation. So we adjusted the design while we were building it um, to, to be able to have a shorter uh, vault here and rearrange the, the bricks and this final part and the sequencing to allow us to finish construction safely, um, which uh, then led to the final vault. And I will run um if we are good on time i'd like to run this video do it it doesn't have sound does it no oh no but still because this is a very nice video to listen to <laughs> and not speak through but um i'll let it run and maybe make some comments along the way So these are um, the first tests within the lab really to identify how we can use multiple robots to assemble the structure. 
her and stably then did a lot of tests on different patterning logics um, and trying to identify sequencing and patterns um, that increase the stability and scaling up the process to uh, full, almost full scale, um, but with a lighter material that would immediately when it failed. We did use glue in these structures um, for obvious safety reasons, um, but also to ensure stability during the construction steps. The geometry is a pure impression uh, geometry, but um, during the construction, it was uh, really helpful to have glue keep the bricks in place. Um, we did this prototype in Princeton, which combines glass and concrete bricks. The reason is being that Concrete is a lot cheaper, um, and we can uh, fabricate those bricks in our own lab uh, for testing reasons and not have the expensive and beautiful glass bricks in, in all our tests. And one other major challenge that we had to work with was the robotic setup um, that was actually. Uh, unclear for a very long time what robots we would have access to. Um, so we had to develop all of our methods to function with, say, a generic robotic setup. We ended up with robots that had a different reach. Uh, they were luckily larger and took more weight than our own robots. Um, but uh, we had to make sure that our methods are applicable and functional with different robotic setups, not customize them for that one specific test case that we had. Um, and then work through the assembly with the glass brick. We, um, we again do the connection by hand. This is, I'd say, simply something uh, that's just not as interesting for me as uh, in placing and generating the geometries. The automation of the um, is for the site. Uh, and we we did look at different. Oh, actually, we did we ended up working with um, acrylic shims in between the bricks to make up for the differences in orientation, but also for the gap sizes were irregular uh, to save on the glue material um, where needed. Construction, it was yeah, larger to go to the end of the 